Um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we, again, we, we, this should be a great event. I know this is one that we've been really excited for. Uh, this is our virtual information session for the uh, DNP program um, uh, in, in nurse anesthesia. Um, really appreciate, like I said, everybody joining us tonight. There's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, uh, but you, you've chosen to spend your time with us. So um, again, thank you very much. Uh, before we go any further, um, we can go ahead and kick it off with, with some introductions. My name is Tom Crash. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions. I will uh, be your, your host and probably the least informed person um, out of anyone on the call tonight about the, the subject matter here. But uh, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, Dr. Manzola. Hi, I'm Dr. Deborah Manzola. I'm the Program Director for the program. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Ambrose. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Ted Ambrose. I'm the Assistant Program Director. I've been with the program since I graduated from the program about <laughs> oh, just about 10 years ago. So uh, not only am I the president, I'm also a client. <laughs> no. Hi, Dr. And, Gilligan. And my name is Dr. Bernie Gilligan. I'm the uh, clinical and simulation uh, coordinator at the program. So welcome everybody, glad you're here. Yep, thank you everybody. Um, so we have a presentation tonight that should run for around 30 or so minutes. Um, and then we can open it up to Q&A. This is being recorded. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to drop it into the uh, Q&A function on the webinar. Uh, for anyone who's watching the recording, thank you for watching. And we will um, have our contact information here at the end if you had any additional questions that you would like answered. But let me go ahead and share my screen and kick off the presentation. Can you guys see my screen? It's coming up. We're good? Yeah, there you okay. go. Looks great here. Yeah. All right, so we started off with why the BSN, the DNP nurse anesthesia program. Okay, well, I'm going to start on that question. Uh, our program has now started in, it actually started back in 2009 with our first class graduating in 2012. And um, we've had now 11 classes. We're a local program that our clinical sites are all within an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes from the actual program. So um, all programs now in anesthesia are going toward the DMP. So we had transitioned our program to the BSN and DMP and have our first class with us on Geisinger campus now. Ted or Bernie, please chime in with anything, why us? Um, because we're awesome. Uh, no, it, you know, as someone that's gone through the program, I, I, have a, I get a unique sort of look, I, like I said, I, I've done it and I've, I've sat in a lot of the chairs in the program. Um, why BSN to DNP? Well, terminal degree is one and, and now all the programs are terminal degree. So it, it is nice to have that at the end. But uh, Bloomsburg is one of those, where I went to high school, it was 13th grade. And when I got to Bloom as a graduate student, it felt like home. It felt like that 13th grade kind of feel. So I, our program is a lot like that. It's a very open door, homey kind of program. So. Uh, if you're looking for that kind of personal experience, it's it's a really good fit. Yeah, and for just to kind of zoom out a little bit, so the view from 10,000 feet um, is of Bloomsburg. This is one of our tent pole programs, nursing. Our, our, the Commonwealth U School of Nursing, this is one of the things that, we, honestly, this might be the thing that we are most well known for is this huge ecosystem of nursing that we have. Um, so again, this is one of the thing that, that one of the things that puts us on the map. So the reputation speaks for itself, for sure. Absolutely, and I think one thing you have to realize is that um, nurse anesthesia programs throughout the country. There's about 130, 140 of them. Uh, we all deliver the same curriculum according to the Council on Accreditation standards. However, you have to look at the culture of the school. You have to look at the people in the school. You have to really take into consideration what fits for you. And I, you know, it, it sometimes it makes admissions people uh, cringe when I say this, but you should look at three programs, at least, that are reasonable that you would attend. Um, I have always felt that whatever program appeals to you, you're going to spend an immense amount of time. It's going to be a life-changing experience. Becoming a nurse anesthetist as a, as, you know, you're a critical care nurse now, yeah. and you're an accomplished adult, making that transition is a huge commitment of time, of energy, of money. And I think you should fit and, and and really ingrain yourself into it so that for the rest of your life, that is what brought you to the point of, of meeting your career goals. And I, I really feel strongly about that. So 
when you come and talk to us and, and, and even these sessions, you know, do we connect or do we not? But I think usually we, we really gen are genuine people. We're honest, genuine people who will tell you our strengths, tell you our weaknesses and tell you areas that we're working on improving. But I will tell you from having been a part of other programs, every single program has that. Every program has strengths, areas they're working on. So, you know, ask those hard questions when you talk to people, when you talk to us and try to get the right fit for you. Fit is is immensely important. Yeah, and, and the fit is a lot more important when you look at the subject matter that you're studying here, which is extremely hard and complicated, and there's a lot at stake here. So the social fabric of the program is a little more important than maybe like an online MBA, right? Where it's that's a little more like you're on your own. This is more of a team sport, it seems like, um, is, is kind of my impression from the outside looking in. Yep, so that, that's, that's a great answer. So our program, since we transitioned from the master's, um, we used to be 33 months in length. We are now 36 months. That's a standard on accreditation requirement of all nurse anesthesia programs. So we do um, offer 101 credits in our program. It's full-time study required. It's delivered in the hybrid form. And when I say that, the first year is um, online, basically. Health assessment, sometimes they bring them in once a week for a uh, class in person, which I think we want to bring back, Dr. Ambrose and Dr. Gilliam were talking about, because it's most beneficial for students. But years two and three, when you transition over to the Geisinger campus, we're located in the annex on the second floor, you are in person. Classes are in person, clinicals are all within Geisinger sites. And um, we are a COA accredited program, which is really important. And like Dr. Gilligan said, if you go and visit other schools, which we encourage that, you know, you have to make sure they're COA accredited. And uh, Dr. Manzola, so why in, in higher ed, you hear a lot about these accreditations. Um, why is that so important? What, what does that mean for prospective students looking at our program and seeing that it is accredited? Well, all different types of programs have a crediting body that um, have to meet certain um, uh, points within their education to get this title of accredited body. And so you need that a lot of times when you're um, looking for a job or if you want to uh, you know, proof that you've received a degree, you want to say, no matter what program you, you are in, that you have uh, come from an accredited program, whether it be teaching, nursing, anything like that. Sure. The other component also that comes into play is that if you are in a program that is under, um, you know, review or, or under suspension, those kind of things can be a factor as to whether the likelihood of the program continuing for successfully meeting your goals is is possible and programs do occasionally come to uh you know accreditation standard issues and then come out of them so it's it, if you have that if you ever see that it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's completely out but you do want to have a frank discussion with the program director about you know what does that mean what is, what what are the issues with the program what are you trying to correct and what yeah. is the likelihood that you're going to be successful in moving forward yep Absolutely. Great. Thanks. So we like to always speak of the highlights of our students. And although in our seats, we have the opportunity to guide our uh, students down the path to achieving um, a pass rate for the NCE, it is truly their accomplishment. So one of the greatest things that we're so happy about is our most recent class, class of 2022. They had a 100% first time pass rate for the NCE. The requirement for uh, the NCE pass rate is 84.1%. So we well exceeded that. We have a 0% attrition rate, 100% employment rate. And um, our overall pass rate is 100% for classes that haven't passed in the first time, but where our average is well above the 84.1 in general from all the years that we've been um, open to, to classes graduating from us. I think, I think one thing I like to mention is that Dr. Menzola's ad, you know, admonishment that it is the accomplishment of the graduates is a statement of the humility of the faculty of this program. 
we we are guides we are experts in our we're subject matter experts in our profession but we also recognize that we have adult students who are coming to us with uh, critical care experience and who are you know transforming themselves into nurse anesthetists and it's their work that meets their goals we help we are guides but you know, for uh, you, you know, for a program director to say that it is the accomplishment of the student, it demonstrates a great deal of humility and honesty. Because it is, we can guide you. We can guide people. But we cannot make them succeed without their effort. And so that's a good point to um, to sort of hang on, even in this session from the very beginning. Yeah, one of the, to me, the, one of the more um, impressive things on this slide, you know, the hundred percent employment rate. You, um, I kind of expected that because there's just such a strong, de- you know, there's just a high demand for this profession, right? But the zero percent attrition rate. So that means for the students that enroll, they graduate and they finish. Um, so again, that goes back to all right. So why are DNP nurse anesthesia program? Well, because again, you've got that support structures in place. They're going to help kind of shepherd you through the program. Um, you're looking at three right now with Dr. Ambrose, Dr. Manzola, and Dr. Gilligan, the way that the program has been built. Um, so basically this is a good investment, our program, because you know you're gonna finish. Um, and it's guaranteed, it's, it's not, I shouldn't say it's guaranteed, but you're obviously, you're gonna get a job and you're gonna, you know, the 100% pass rate. Those are not an, um, anomalies by any means, so. We, we are proud of our rather low attrition rate, um, you know, historically through the program. <laughs> Uh, because it says a couple of things to me. It says, number one, the things you just said, we're trying real hard, we're working with the students, we're you know, making that home atmosphere. But number two is we do select quality students. Uh, this is, you know, like every nurse anesthesia program, it's a difficult program to get into. And when we select students, we select the fit for our program. So not only <laughs> when the students come to us, do they have to find the folk program fits them, they have to fit our program. So when you make that cut and you make the class of, you know, whatever our next cohort is, um, students kind of have that feel like they belong to something because we've selected them to fit with the group of people they're going to sit with and that they, you know, that we can see success in them. So it, it's not just, we don't, we don't fill seats for money. We fill seats because we see success. And that, right. that is, you know, that is not every program and that is not every nursing program, but that's a, a very Bloomsburg way of looking at it, I think. Yeah. Dr. I think- Ambrose, I just, oh, and, and Dr. Gilligan, I just want to add on to that. And I think you can both align with me saying that we've had students come back, not make it through our, um, into our program the first time. And honestly, we tell them, well, they reach out to us and say, well, why? And I'll say, you need to do this. This is what you need to do to become a stronger applicant. And we've had students that come, came back twice and even third times before they got in. And I say to them, I appreciate it. You listened to exactly what we suggested to make you stronger. And it did. And they were successful, got in the program, graduated. And we, you know, we always make sure we have that true sense of communication with them because when we take them in, our goal is to graduate them. We've, we've created remediation programs for students to help them um, get through the program many a times and sometimes that's the hardest work for it i know dr ambrose could definitely <laughs> yeah we, but the, there's honestly when you get to a graduate program or you know even an undergrad program there's nothing more frustrating than walking into a program knowing say we're going to take 25 but we only want 15 to graduate and there are programs out there that you know will take students because they want you know they'll take more than they think because they want to make sure they grad we take what we're ready to graduate and we right. make sure those students grow and learn with us because we don't like attrition. So it, if we put, if you put the effort in, we'll put the effort in for you. Yeah. One thing I have to say too, is that, and I like to speak to the uh, blatantly honest part of it. And I think everybody is, is that have there been students who have not successfully completed the program? Sure. Usually I will tell you this from being a part of several programs over the course of about two, 17 years is that usually it is a very deep personal issue, usually, that leads to somebody not successfully completing a program. It's not the norm. And especially when people have demonstrated, as uh, Dr. Menzola and Dr. Ambrose have talked about, the fact that they are humble and teachable. If you're teachable, and if if you don't get in and we say, hey, listen, go do this, and you do it, 
that ability to, you know, take our advice and our advice is for your benefit to, for your betterment um, is, you know, that it's not us, it's you who would have that aspect of your personality that says, I can take suggestions from people who are, you know, who are demonstrating my best interest and go with it and grow in that direction. That's usually what it takes to be successful in this program. It's very different. It's very, I'll tell you that anesthesia is very different than everything else in society and medicine. Nurse anesthesia are a group of very, very talented type A people who are good at what they do, who sometimes are very competitive, but who also need, um, they need feedback and they need direction. If you can take that direction, you'll be successful. I, I've never found a student who could not succeed under those circumstances. Uh, Tom, we have a question. Do you want me to take this quick? Because it's yes. It's, so uh, yeah, the, the, the question we got here is how many spots are there total in the program? Um, there's 15 a class at a maximum. Um, but as the director says, that doesn't mean we have to take 15. It means if we find 15 applicants who fit the mold for our program and who you know kind of fit the way we do things, we'll take 15. If we only find 12, we'll take 12. Um, but, you know, 15 is our maximum right now. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So that brings us to the coursework, right? So kind of taking people behind the scenes now, pulling the curtain back a little bit. What's year one like? So the first year is the basically online year. So I'm not sure if all the uh, attendees are aware, uh, Bloomsburg allows nine credits total that can be transferred in. So sometimes students take a class, um, a graduate class that they don't know exactly what they're gonna do and it ends up being a class that's required for us. If they submit it to us, and usually they send it to me with the syllabi, um, I take it to um, our administration. We see if it aligns with the rigor of our classes here at Bloomsburg. If it does, it could transfer in. So that in a, that saves money, definitely nine credits worth three classes. So summer, fall, winter, and spring are all online. In spring, you see there's that advanced health assessment and promotion class. And that in the past has been a come to class um, once a week. They had changed that to online, but further discussion is for the anesthesia people. We would like to bring them in and give them more hands-on assessment before uh, they get to clinical. You know, we're discussing that. And uh, Tom, like you said, our programs, one is we evaluate it, not every year, we evaluate it, reevaluate it every semester to see how we can make it better for the students to succeed and get more out of it. And we do have another question here. Um, what describes a candidate that is a good fit for the program? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it's one of those, it, it, we could wax poetic for hours about what the right stuff for a program is. Um, but it, the big things are, I think some of Dr. Gilligan's hit this a couple of times. Um, we need experience, we need, you know, intelligence, we need aptitude, we need those kind of things. But most of the people that come to us and apply are, already have that. What sets um, candidates that, that are great fits for our program apart from everyone else is humility, you know, being humble, being ha having that humility, the teachability. This is a difficult profession to learn. Um, everyone listening to me out there in audience land are the best of the best on their floors. They're charge nurses. They run all the technology. People come to them to ask them questions. When you come here, you start it at ground zero all over again. I, I like to joke with the students that said, you went from the smartest guy in the room to dumb as a rock real quick. And then you have to build that back up. So you need someone that's willing to learn, willing to work with you, but humble enough to start from basically the beginning again, because you're, you're learning a whole new, whole new skill. Um, some of the other big stuff that it doesn't always get talked about, but is really helpful when you get to a program of this level, um, you need a support system. So students that have a family support system or a good friend support system, it, people that have reasonable financial security, so that they, they didn't just, you know, 
they're not worried about are they going to be able to eat while they're in the program so they have some of their life squared away a little bit so these are things we encourage students to do before they get to us you know uh, set aside a little money or you know we're all nurses and we're all working through what the tail end of a pandemic work a little overtime you know make sure you're comfortable have that support system because your family's not going to understand what it's like this is really difficult and we like to joke the only people that know about this program what it feels like is the people that graduated from this program so you know having that support system and having your life squared away is a big deal but if i had to pick i would take the teachable humble person over the person with the 4-0 every day yeah i think also i just want to add sometimes we get applicants that really don't know much about anesthesia they either think this is the next next step they should do as a critical care nurse but those applicants that come in that really did talk about and look up and then um, do some research on what exactly um, is required in nurse anesthesia, maybe some of the political aspects that are going on in nurse anesthesia, things that we're up against. Um, they're, they're really important things to come in kind of 100% prepared and enthused to come into the program. You know, instead of just somebody thinking, I'm just going to throw my application in to see if I get in. Yeah, absolutely. That brings us to year two. So, Dr. Ambrose, you want to talk about year two when they come to us? Uh, so second year, you you come to visit us at the big house. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it, it during the first year, because it's it's almost completely online, um, students have an opportunity to still maintain employment. So when I talked about financial stability, that's a great thing about the first year. You could still pick some shifts off. You could still work. I personally worked a weekend program through my first year of school, and it's it's challenging, but it's doable because there are a lot of credits. Second year is where life gets a little different because you are no longer employed. Year R is full time, and it is basically a full time job. Um, you're on campus. We're in the OR five days a week. Um, the OR starts after about a seven to eight week boot camp for us. So we prepare you in a crash course in how not to hurt people in the OR and how to give some basic anesthetic care, building on your prior critical care nursing skills. And then from there, you know, the, the learning curve is steep. Um, I, I always picture the, uh, what was the guy on the Price is Right? The yodeler guy that's going up the, the <laughs> mountain. That's how I picture the first year because you are, you're trying not to fall off the cliff, but you're going up pretty quick. Um, our concepts and our foundations courses are, you're gonna learn a lot of anatomy and physiology over again, and then you're gonna learn how we do it in anesthesia. So when people ask us what they could do to prep to come in, my, my biggest thing is go over some math <laughs> because let's face it, no one likes math. Um, and number two, go over your anatomy and physiology again. Make sure that you have those foundations down. Like when you're doing the critical care nurse stuff, start thinking about what systems you're actually working on and what you're hearing when you hear things and seeing when you see things. Because we cover that again, but we cover it from the anesthesia vein. And then everyone's favorite part, pharmacology. We do an intense pharmacology course. There's a lot of drugs to learn and you learn it down at the cellular level. So while y'all are practicing now, think about what you're given. Metoprolol just doesn't make the heart rate go down. It does a lot of things. There's a lot to learn. Um, interspersed with our courses from anesthesia specific, there's still some APRN courses in there like biomedical ethics and, and things of the sort. So you're still getting a well-rounded look at population health and ethical conundrums and things of the sort while we're doing anesthesia. As this year goes on, the clinical component gets more and more. So we start with like two days-ish in the OR and we ramp up to three, sometimes four days in the OR a week. Um, so it's a very hands-on, very heavy year. Um, I just wanted to add, I think many students say, well, why can't you work once you get to clinical practice? And there's two reasons for that. First reason is it's unsafe because you put more than 40 hours in a week just in school, studying, prepping, going to clinical. Second reason is if you would be working in the unit as a nurse and all of a sudden somebody needed to be intubated or somebody need an arterial line and you would think, oh, I, I can intubate, I know how to do that because you're trying to save the person and you step out of your um, requirement of your practice as a registered nurse, you could lose your license as a nurse 
and our program could lose their accreditation. So that is why we do not allow in the second and third year students to work. Uh, I'll give you a little example of what Dr. Menzola is talking about when she talks about hours. Uh, I gr I'm a graduate of the program in 2013, um, and we still have a similar tracking software uh, that tracks your hours. So we we have you personally track class hours, clinical hours, prep hours, study hours. Um, I was really honest with my tracking software because I really wanted to know. And when I finished the program, I took my hours and I divided it by the number of days that I was in the program. I averaged somewhere between 10 and 11 hours a day, seven days a week dedicated to the program. So there is a lot of there's a lot of time that goes into this program in study, in clinical prep, in review. It, it, it is kind of difficult. It, it gets in the way of a lot of things and work is probably, um, I don't see many people being able to be successful while working. So we just don't allow it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like this is a, this is a, a program that's less of a degree and more of a lifestyle. Yes. Uh, a lifestyle that will pay Tremendous dividends, right? It, it, it will track yes. you into an outstanding career. And I do see that there are some questions um, in the Q&A. Most of them are about admissions. And I promise we're almost to the admissions uh, slide where we can uh, run through some of these questions because the, the questions are outstanding. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people wondering the same thing. Um, but I, I just wanted to get through the coursework first. So then that gets to year three. Okay, year three. So this is so bittersweet for us, isn't it, Dr. Ambrose and Dr. Gilligan? Because as we see our seniors, so this is, uh, you know, they're going to get ready to graduate then right after in year three. So um, it's very heavy with clinical practice. They finish up their rigorous didactic and basically fall and spring is just about all clinical. So um, they are still working on their DMP project of course, because that's throughout the whole program, but um, a lot of clinical base because, you know, we have to make sure, although we want a rigorous uh, doctoral project, we want them to know how to give anesthesia and we want them to pass the NCE. And the other component of this is that you're ramping up for your preparation for the, the NCE. You'll hear us say NCE a lot. It's the National Certification Exam. So what we were really trying to do and as a, a item writer, a question writer for the national certification exam, not giving away any trade secrets here, we really try to groom you to take all that, that you've learned, everything that you've assembled clinically, didactically, and otherwise, and become a wonderful, and we do this actually from the beginning, mm -hmm. become a test taker. You have to be a test taker. It's a separate skill set. You have to be a clinician, you have to be an academician, and you have to be a, a test taker. Because how do you demonstrate that you can successfully, you know, provide anesthesia, except in this, in our profession, on a written exam? So what we really focus on is uh, discernment, is the depth of study that you need to accomplish in order to be successful. They're really, you know, for the last, for that final stretch, that's, we're putting a lot of energy into that part of it. So I really feel like that's something that this program offers that is very, very beneficial. It is that element of, okay, you know, I, I know how to give anesthesia. By the end of it, you actually do know how to give anesthesia. However, in order to give anesthesia and to move on in your profession, you have to be able to be successful on a very, very challenging exam. And I can say from my profession, from my experience, it was the hardest test I've ever taken. It's, well, we can accomplish it, of course. Uh, last year we had, you know, in, in, in the past, we've had 100% pass rates, but it's not a given. It, you have to work for it. That's the only downside of having a 100% pass rate, if there is one, is that people think, oh, you know, I'll go there and I'll have 100% pass rate. That 100% is, is on the shoulders of people who work very hard and listen to us. To uh, I'm going to dovetail on Dr. Gilligan here just a second. This is different than your undergrad preparation, too. Um, you know, undergrad nursing, we, you know, I, I remember undergrad nursing, you would sit in the classroom, you'd get this lecture. Um, the instructors would kind of give you the, the outline of the lecture. You'd get the lecture, take your notes. Next day, you'd go in the lab and you'd do whatever they just lectured on. 
And then next day you'd be in clinical and you'd do exactly what they lectured on. This is a little different. There's a lot of self learning. And this is why we talk humble, teachable, adult learning principles. Uh, there's a lot of things that come at you all at once. You're not going to know everything your first day. And like your first day of clinical, you still have to take care of the whole patient. We can't just send you in there and say, hey, I learned airway today. I could just do the airway. No, no, no. They still got a, they still got a heartbeat. and Their kidneys still need to work and they still need to wake up at the end. So it, it, it is a little different than your undergraduate preparation. That's when we talk about being good test takers and learning this whole way through. Senior year is a lot of review stuff. We cover things again and again and again because we want to make sure you've learned the topics and picked them up. This is if you were climbing the mountain in the in the second year, this is where you're sort of at the top and we're polishing those skills before we come back down to take the test. Yep. yep. Great. And yeah, Dr. Ambrose, I like your analogy of uh, you said year number two, you're coming to the big house. It's like you're going from AAA to the major leagues. You know, you're 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 getting the, the call up there um, and we have some new facilities coming our way now too. So we do. We have a new nursing simulation lab being the third floor of the McCormick building on Bloomsburg campus is getting redone and dedicated only to nursing. Where current previously it was um, education and nursing. So it's going to be all nursing. There's going to be a new undergrad lab, uh, uh, undergraduate lab, which you see right there in front of you. And then we're going to have a separate anesthesia portion, which will have an operating room, other facilities that you would actually have in an OR. So that's huge for us. And um, we're just very excited about all the opportunities it's gonna give us with our, our next classes to come. One thing I can speak to as a, as a clinician who has practiced simulation, even prior to being a nurse anesthetist as a flight nurse, um, we did a, a great deal of simulation. And then that was my initial role after graduating from school is that we are very haptic people, but we're very hands-on, okay? Critical care nurses are, hap are, are haptic. They learn best when you tie, uh, you know, academic discussion into practice or simulation into clinical. And you tie those three things together. And this benefit, now where we are right now is excellent. Where we're going is amazing as far as the opportunities for, uh, people to immerse themselves in a clinical setting where it's a very believable, very high fidelity uh, environment where you are going to take your simulated patient from pre-op to operative to post-op, manage issues in every phase. That is a really invaluable. It, it's invaluable, the opportunity to do that. So it's very exciting. It's very exciting to hear that. I. Uh, that's my baby. My, my, my enjoyment is medical simulation simply, simply because it ties so many things together. And I believe that you will be the benefactor of these advancements. Um, you know, where we are now is, like I said, where we are now puts people, we, we really prepare people to enter clinical and then we visit them intermittently to boost them up. This environment is going to be excellent. It's going to be amazing. It's exciting. And it looks like we have a, a question from Dana about the simulation lab. So the, this is a great slide to take care of it on. Uh, so will the simulation lab be shared with any other students or is it purely for our CRNA students? So yes and no. On Geisinger's campus, we have a, a smaller simulation lab that is just yours, that we have mannequins, anesthesia machines, and all the equipment that we could teach you on. At the university level, um, I think what you're missing from the picture that we're showing you is this is not a simulation lab. This is a simulation center. So the lab you're looking at now is a lab. If you walk down the hallway and go around, according to the artist rendering, we're going to have a pre-op post-op next door to that in a separate room is going to be the operative suite where we can take the patient from pre-op to the OR. We could take them across the hallway to the ICU when we're done. Apparently, there's supposed to be a mother-baby unit right across so they could teach maternal health. So we have lots of different things we could do with that. Now, now the OR is going to be mostly your domain, but there's nothing to say we can't have undergrad nurses in there being operative nurses while you're being the anesthetic delivery person, the CRNA. Um, the same when we talk pre and post. There's nothing to say that we can't pair up with, say, the nurse practitioners or the undergrad nurses and staff the pre-op. You pick up your patient in pre-op like you would on a normal day, take them to the OR, bring them back out to post-op, and everyone kind of gets an experience. 
So while we may share the simulation lab in theory, when we get there, your equipment is still yours for simulation. We're sharing an experience and going across the across the boundaries here between undergrad, graduate, and the different programs. So it's actually kind of better that we're going to share that lab because it's going to offer us a more well-rounded simulation experience. And and usually that that kind of question comes out of being bumped for other for other people to gain other experiences, and I don't see us um, allowing that in the sense of we have our own space for you know, preparation for entry to clinical preparation, you know, what we try to do is really introduce simulation almost on day one, sometimes literally day one, and take it right to the last semester where we're teaching things like crisis resource management, where you are the crisis manager in an intraoperative emergency, and everything in between. So the space is there, whether it's on campus or on Geisinger campus, for all of that. And I, I guess my goal is to be reassuring to people who have those questions that, that um, those needs will be met. And to the other simulation questions just popped up from Jasmine, will we have the opportunity to work with anesthesia students in a cohort before us in the sim lab for mentor-mentee purposes? Absolutely. Um, our students all work together. So yeah. when you get to campus, the seniors will, when you're on Bloom's campus, it, they do some lab work there. When you get to us on Geisinger Danville's campus, and we'll go back and forth, the senior students will mentor the junior students, as will the faculty. We'll be hands-on with you, and you'll have senior students teaching you some of what you're going to do. And then when you roll over to senior year, part of your projects and your responsibilities are to mentor the junior students and teach them. So, you know, we're, we're graduating doctorally prepared advanced practice nurses, and a part of that curriculum is learning to be a leader and learning to teach. So that means you have to be able to pick both of those up and the sim lab offers is a great opportunity. So good but question. Also, also supported by us. Like, uh, I think that's one thing that that people sometimes feel like doctoral students are different. Doctoral students are subject matter experts who are learning something additional. And that additional piece requires some support from the faculty. It's not like we're just going to go, poof, there you go. But, you know, we're going to be there in a guiding way to say, hey, listen, you know, pre, pre-lesson, intra-lesson, and even post-lesson, uh, how you present things, how you, you know, be mindful of the level of the learner. So it's, it's not only creating nurse anesthetists, it's creating educators. Every CRNA is an educator. Whether you decide to go and be a faculty member, you are kind of a faculty member because you, you will teach clinically more than likely, and you will teach people at the bedside, which is the hardest classroom ever. Sim lab's easy compared to, to, to doing something in the, in the moment when you're anesthetizing a patient. But we try to prepare you to view your learners and, and to give your learners lesson or level appropriate lessons and not expose them to excessive stress and also to debrief, so to, to view it as an educational process. Yep, great. Life as a CRNA grad student. Yep, and this is something that we've talked a lot about um, already. Um, Dr. Manzola, do you have anything to add about what, what are students doing when they're not, sorry, we know what they're doing in class to a certain degree. We know the classes they're taking. We know the clinical rotations, but what are they doing when they're not actively engaged in a class? Well, one thing that we really promote is community service. And part of that is education and giving back. Uh, in the photo here you see on this slide, we had just gone to a local high school and we presented what, what it is to become a CRNA. And we also had hands-on stations for high school students to go around. We had an intubating station, we had two intubating stations. We had a spinal and epidural station and we had gowning and gloving. Because so many people, especially high school students, unless they have somebody medical that's a CRNA actually in their family or a close friend, then they don't really even know what nurse anesthesia is. So part of this is we want to continue our profession. We really want to yell it from the rooftops if we can about how great this profession is and how much we love it. So um, that I love this photo because it was just what last a few weeks ago, Dr. Ambrose, that we went there and uh, 
were able. And the senior students, always the first round of high school students that come in, our students are even a little timid. And once they show and they're like, to showing them what to do with their hands on and and they just loved it. Then they were diving deep and come on, you know, gathering around to do the thing. So um, I think another uh, community service we did is we helped give um, uh, blood pressure and flu vaccines uh, for the university. Uh, we also helped give COVID vaccines for um, the Lackawanna chapter of, I can't recall the whole name of it, Health and Human Services or something. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, it, you know, outside of community service too, we give back to the profession and you start that as a student. Um, you see me drinking from one of my billboards. I, I walk around like a billboard all the time. Um, you know, a pack donation. Uh, you're looking at like, I'm currently on the board for the Pennsylvania Association of Nurse Anesthetists, Dr. Manzola, Dr. Gilligan, both former board members. I, I'm currently on a, a committee for the ANA. Dr. Menzel is a chairperson on a committee for the ANA. Dr. Gilligan's a board writer and he's lectured nationally. So we give back a lot. We take you with us. So we do state meetings. We do national meetings. We go and lobby on Capitol Hill. We go meet our, our local state legislators and we talk about healthcare, and not just anesthesia issues. We talk about healthcare delivery issues, how to better rural populations, how to improve population health. We, you know, we hit a lot of issues here, how to get title Title IX, fund, Title Eight funding for nursing and those kind of things. So, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of things outside of the classroom, quote unquote, that go into this education. And a lot of it is building a well-rounded provider that's community focused and, you know, willing to teach the next generation to make sure our profession keeps moving forward. Because we've been around since the Civil War. We don't want to go anywhere yet. Yeah, I think the new uh, logo is the first anesthesia providers, because that was what nurses we are. are. We, we are first I anesthesia know that. providers. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. We taught the docs how to do it, so <laughs> they, they owe us a debt of gratitude, whether they like it or not. <laughs> oh, and this photo is so exciting because not only oh wait, this is this is the one about the. The perfection of the first time pass rate. Yes, we were so proud of this class for doing that. Um, and I think I thought it was the next slide, Tom, that you were going to show with the oh. college bowl. Oh. Yeah. So proud. This, yes, first time ever we won the college bowl at uh, PANA, our spring symposium in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Our students work so hard and uh, York actually won it like eight or 10 times in a row. Their students are a little, uh, I think they give them more study time at the end or they're ready to take boards like at this time. And our students uh, don't have as much study time yet as at this time, but uh, we were so proud of them at this, the first time we won. Yeah, we came in second place the year before. We missed a championship by a question. And then this year we, uh... I'm uh, proud of these four that they, they pulled it out. But, uh, you know, when you look, this is a whole team effort. So the, the entire class is just like, we're still on cloud nine, as is yeah. President Hannah, who we took a trophy to recently. Um, but this is, this is part of what we do outside of the classroom. This is our association spring meeting. Uh, these students showed up and actually learned the entire time they were there, and then they won the championship. So you know, they, they gave back to the profession. They did some education. They, they did a, we did a PAC event while we were there. So they, you know, gave back politically and then boom, came back with a trophy. Came back victorious. Absolutely. So yeah, our job outlook uh, is really important. 100% employment within the first six months after graduation. There's positions available throughout the country, just like nursing right now. CRNAs, we always seem to be in need, but right now more than ever. And, you know, there's a variety of roles for our graduates and not only in the operating room. I mean, you can apply to be um, a professor at a university. You can be uh, political. You can go more the political route with your job. You can get into administration. Uh, there's a lot of at Geisinger, there's a team and an act model, but many of our, our colleagues have left and actually opened their own businesses. So, and they do 1099s um, 
on their own and in offices giving anesthesia? Yeah. Uh, we have a graduate who's uh, running his own department up in uh, where is he? He's in Maine. Yes. Zach. Yeah, uh, he's the uh, he's the chief of his department. We have uh, many independent 1099 CRNAs. Uh, we have a bunch of them that are are do education work. Like they have uh, uh, LLCs where they not only do they do anesthesia, they they provide education to other anesthetic professionals. So it, there's a very there's a ton of roles you can do when you get out. One thing to realize, you know, we talk about these numbers, um, 1099 is basically an independent contractor who, who can go into a facility and say, I can offer these services for this amount of time, negotiate your own terms, contract, and it gives you a great degree of flexibility. Now, that is something that, you know, there's an additional sort of learning curve to doing that successfully, but these options you know, you may have be coming, you may be coming out of an era in nursing where you sort of had that. And if you like that, that's something that exists and has for a while in anesthesia. Yeah, in high demand for sure. One of my pictures. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we're, as we have talked about some of this review, we've graduated 11 classes. Um, uh, ooh, there's a typo. Our inaugural class did not graduate in 21, but our inaugural DNP class is our, our first cohort of DNP students is with us now. Um, our first our first cohort graduated in 2012. Um, and little fun note, that was my brother, so he beat me to graduation. <laughs> when we talk, it's a family program. It's a family program. It's a family um, affair, right? Yeah. Um, 104 alumni. We have a lot still at Geisinger Danville. We have a lot within the Geisinger system. So you will meet a lot of Bloom CRNAs. They know what you need to get through the program and they are wonderful mentors, mentee, uh, like people just to reach out and have a coffee with. They're great people for this. Um, we talked about some of the career paths already and involvement in the program. Like I said, I am a graduate of the program. Um, Dr. Menzola is an undergrad graduate of Bloomsburg University. I'm a graduate student, graduate of Bloomsburg University. We, you know, Huskies come back and we give back to our program. So we have a lot of lecturers that are former students that come back. Um, even uh, pictured here, we have one of our graduates in the middle of the screen. He comes back and teaches airway for us. Um, so we have a lot of people who went through the program and feel that that family love and they wanna give back to the profession. They come back and lecture and help. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're looking for the big extended family, there's a lot of us. And there's a question here that, that kind of dovetails nicely with what you're just talking about, Dr. Ambrose. Um, does Bloomsburg offer any opportunities to speak with former graduates who work as 1099 or run their own businesses? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we've we had, um, who, who just came in? Kira Zarek, uh, one of our former graduates. I, I, I almost thought I was doing a HIPAA violation. They're a student, they're okay. Uh, uh, she's, one of, she's one of our graduates. She's, she works over at, I believe, Evangelical now, but she's done time on her own. She's done 1099 and she's done W2. Um, we do have several students that come in and, and you can ask about the business aspect and that side of it. That's also another reason why we do some of the state meeting things we do and take you guys out of the classroom because you get a lot of networking and you get exposed to a lot of different practice models and people who do things differently than just the Geisinger slash Bloomsburg way of doing it. Anesthesia is different everywhere across the country. So you will meet people who, you know, may offer a different view or do things a little differently than us. So that there's a lot of opportunity to meet those people. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, and then that brings us to the application and admission process. And I know what we'll do is we'll um, get through the app and, and admission overview, and then we will get to some of the questions, because again, the questions are outstanding. So I really appreciate those and, and appreciate everyone's patience, but go ahead, guys. So there's an online graduate school application, and uh, I think that's pretty easy to find, isn't it, Tom? I Indeed. never went on to find it, right? It oh, is. yeah, it's yes. right on our it's right on our website web page. What am I saying? Like it, you can apply now. So requirements are um, a baccalaureate degree in nursing from a nationally accredited school program. You need your official college transcripts, and there we want to see all of them because sometimes I think applicants might not do well if they took a couple classes. But you know, you just want to show it. You, if we know that you went somewhere else, you just kind of want to show everything you did. A lot of times. Students don't do well if they started um, maybe at a community college and then went and transferred. 
But you know what, you just kind of want to put it on the table and show us where you've been. A lot of times there was growth reasons why students don't always do well in the first year, either at where they started off. And we just like to see that. We want to see the whole person, the whole applicant that's trying to come into our program. Um, we want your copy of your current uncumbered professional nursing license. So I think I saw in the chat, somebody said that they don't have a Pennsylvania license because they're out of state, which is fine. Um, if and when you get um, apply and get into the program, then you'd have to apply for the Pennsylvania license. But we do, do need a copy of your unencumbered license of where you are. I, I will give you a warning. Anyone that's applying for a Pennsylvania nursing license, if you're looking not just at our program, there's 14 in the state. We're one of 14. If you're looking at any of the programs and you have, uh, you know, ideas of getting into a program in Pennsylvania, start on your nursing license early. We have a huge backup and there's been a whole, um, I don't know if it's COVID supply chain issues, but whatever the heck we would, Russians right. bombing, right. <laughs> who knows? Um, it, there's been a big issue in the Department of Licensure uh, of the state in getting nursing licenses out. In fact, Pennsylvania nursing licenses have been delayed by three months, I think this year, for those of us that already have licenses. So you can imagine what it's like getting one from out of state. So start early. Um, I did just realize when I moved my pictures around, I missed the GPA requirement of at least a 3.2. Say you have a 3.0 or a 3.1 and you think, well, I can't even apply. You can apply, but what I do suggest is you take a graduate course and because we want to see, so say you take, you have a 3.0 or a 3.1 GPA and you're kind of down on yourself. I would say, go take a graduate course. Say you're going to get an A on it, I'm sure, because you're going to work hard. And now you'll be able to present the both and say, listen, I really, I can do graduate program work and that helps your application. Um, your resume, which we want to see includes description of um, professional nursing clinical experience. We want um, BLS, ACLS, and some students don't have PALS yet, but you know, if you're going to take the class, at least um, get the class scheduled and show proof that you're scheduled for a PALS certification class. We do ask for a short narrative describing your personal and professional goals, three nurse anesthesia recommendation forms. And I think in the chat, was there something, Tom, yeah, about there's a question in there? So work like manager, coworkers. That's what we like to see in our recommendation forms, not just the person you shadow, because they're not going to know um, you very well because they're not actually co-working. But we do need um, a documentation of at least eight hours of shadowing experience. We do have a form on the website, but you can just have some information typed out if you cannot locate the form and have the CRNA sign it with their information on it. If you have if you have a problem, and one thing I like to mention, uh, we've been around the block. If you have a problem with your manager um, providing a reference, contact us because we know that some managers are very, they love you uh, and they've made you, you know, wonderful critical care nurses, helped you to become that and they don't want to lose you. So if for some reason you get some pushback, reach out to us. There, there are some things we can work with. Uh, we would prefer that, but we also recognize that there are some other factors at play that may impact it. So please, you know, we, we want you to be an applicant. We, we do want to see your information. So if you have that problem, please reach out to us and maybe we can figure something out. And honestly, to that vein, it looks like I could knock a couple questions out here. Uh, for the shadow experience, I didn't have the form. That is fine. As Dr. Mm -hmm. Manzola mentioned, if you type something up or have the CRNA type us up a letter and sign it to vouch for your, your hours, we're cool with that. Um, I have a couple questions here that talk about uh, GPA and uh, someone someone anonymously is is uh, a person after my own heart having admittedly been less than a stellar undergraduate student listen I feel like I just wrote that question um, <laughs> what we've all done things I, I will be very honest I was a five-year nursing graduate because I enjoyed the beginning of college a lot more than I should have. <laughs> We've all done those things. That's why when Dr. Menzola said, when you send us your GPA and you send us all your paperwork, send us everything. We want to see that growth. We want to see, hey, you started with a 2-4 in your first semester. And look at you graduated still with a 3-1 after starting that poorly. Because look, 3-8, 3-9, knocking the nursing and science courses out. Those things are okay. Um, 
what we want to see is that that personal growth and we do look at the human side of it um i i think i saw another one here do i include all my courses or just my my bachelor's all of them we want to see if you've done two degrees we want to see both of your transcripts we want to see every college you've gone to we want to take a look at your courses um ultimately we can we can see what courses what colleges you've attended so we can see if you haven't put them in the other thing is realize something we are setting people up to be successful so if you are a 2.8 and you're not quite there um academic clinical and and personality are the three components of this so you know we i think are understanding and supportive but we also want to guide people in a direction to give evidence, not only to us, but to yourself, that you can be successful. And the academic piece of it cannot be, you're gonna sit there at the end of this program and take the NCE and you have to pass it. And you have to be able to get, past, you have to find it within yourself to gather your academic acumen to be successful. So we need evidence of that. I think that's what we're looking at is, you know, it's not, you know, if you're 18 years old and got a 2.8, fine, take some courses, but ultimately don't down, don't, it, it, it's not about, oh, I could be a great anesthetist, but I'm just not good taking tests. You got to be both. Oh, you're a couple good. other things here, man. Uh, I just lost it. Oh, someone said they did not have an undergrad chemistry course. What do you recommend? Take one. You need some sort of chemistry with a lab. Yeah. So find, um, don't find a community. Well, find a college, college. Yeah. And, I mean, it could, I guess, technically be a community college. We need be. a college level course With where you lab. took chemistry that had a lab. That's it. So mm -hmm. it's not a, not a huge requirement there. Um, I'm currently enrolled in a graduate. Okay. So someone's in a grad course and it's going to end past the application date. Tell us about it. Yep. Let us know. Hey, I'm in a grad course. I will get you my grades when I finish. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah, and the idea is that you might not re receive an acceptance. You might receive a conditional acceptance or something like that that's predicated on that. Um, one thing, and uh, maybe people haven't heard this, but I want to want you to realize is that while we love that your 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 grade in nursing theory is an A, um, anesthesia is a very scientific practice. So, chemistry, physics biology, all those things weigh heavily. And Ted did mention it, Dr. Ambrose did mention it. The idea of your science grades weighing heavily into this is critical. So if you're, you know, not all of us are bench scientists where we're gonna go into, uh, you know, get a PhD in biology or chemistry, but you have to be able to grasp the basic concepts to grasp the basic concepts of anesthesia because they really are the same. So we're not coming from a, it's not a preference perspective. It's really about the principle of what we're doing. And the questions are pouring in. We are popular here. Good. Um, yeah. Is there a length requirement for the resume? Is it more like a CV? CVs are great. Tell us about all your professional experience that has to do with nursing and tell us about all of you've done in academia. We love it. How does the program feel about NICU hours? We love NICU nurses. Mm -hmm. We have graduated several NICU nurses and they have kicked butt in our program. If you can take care of the little ones, you can take care of the big ones. That is wonderful. And that's not always the case in every program. I will tell you that. Um, I, I feel like if you can do mental math, if you can sit there and on the fly do these things, it's very similar to anesthesia. And if you can appreciate physiologic differences, that's another big difference. So that's great. Let's see, took a stats course 15 years ago and currently taking a graduate level stats course be complete by mid-January. That is perfect. Yeah. You asked if it's okay, we love it. Um, recently graduated from a BSN program. Okay. Well, here Get comes on it to our one, at least one year critical, current full-time critical care experience. Yes. Dr. Ambrose. Get, get your feet under you because here's what we're going to say. It takes a good six months to orient to a unit. So we like a year after that orientation, a minimum if we could get it. You can start compiling your stuff now. It's like start doing your CCRN, make sure you have your ACLS, BLS pals. You can start getting all that stuff ready. I would give it a year and apply to the program. Make sure you have your feet under you in the unit at least. I love that enthusiasm. I really do. But we want you to learn how to be, you learn so much. I love nursing in general. I just love nursing. 
I love meeting the people. I used to, I loved everything about it and I still do. So you have to really learn how to be a nurse. And then you learn, because you want to learn how to assess a patient. You go into critical care sometimes. A lot of applicants that come right out of school are learn, looking at the monitors. And you really have to learn how to assess a patient. And you use the monitors as another resource. When I meet a patient in pre-op, I have about five minutes to make myself, uh, make them comfortable with myself and my ability to practice because I'm about to hold their life in my hands. So part of nursing is that bedside manner and that ability to reach people and do the assessment and be skilled. But you have to have someone trust you really quickly. And that does take some time at the bedside. That, that is a, honestly, that is a very, very good point. And as the person, probably the only person in this room who's only ever been on the side of the receiving end of the anesthesia, that is, yeah, that is, that is a great point. As someone who, actually, that was, uh, I'm sorry. That was one of our applicants that came back. She came back twice. And the reason was, is she just was not ready. And we saw this in this third time she came back and I said, she's ready. It was so obvious. So as someone who currently lives in Minnesota, would I need to be living in PA by day one since it's online for the first year? <sighs> so um, that's a great question because on the university side, there are some states that I, I'd have to clarify that. Tom, who would I go to? Um, I know I met with um, Dr. Kim Olszewski and I met with. Um, yeah, friend, there is. I, we have someone in our business office on campus who handles residency questions. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, but we do have someone in, in on our you know on our campus who who's who will be able to speak to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, probably the easiest thing to do is I'll put my email in the chat. If you could just send me your contact information, that would be helpful. Uh, let's see, letter of recommendation. We talked about you know current coworkers, professors are fine. Your your. Um, department head, things like that. Um, how do we submit the application and other paperwork? That's all online. Go to our website. Um, there are links for just about everything there. Um, what test prep is provided for the NCE? A lot. <laughs> so three years, three years we have you in a chair <laughs> teaching the anesthesia. But on top of that, um, that that's half joke. Um, on top of that, we we have Dr. Gilligan who writes the boards. Um, we use two boards preps programs that are intertwined into our program. We do what's called senior review. So our seniors lecture the other seniors and sometimes the juniors, the material that they're going to have to cover on the boards as a review. And for the juniors, they're teaching it for the first time to them. Um, but they review with each other. We do some study time towards the end where you study in groups that's guided by us. We give during the senior review time, I give review tests. Um, so this is weekly or biweekly. You have online review tests that you take. So you're practicing board style questions in a board style scenario. We use the self-evaluation exam, the C that's given by the NBCRNA, which is a board simulation exam. It's 240 questions and it is a bear, but we have you take it once in your junior year, once in your senior year to help you prepare for that austere environment, sitting in front of the computer, taking the test kind of thing. One thing to realize is that when you are taking the NCE, your exam is being written as you take it. So we can't sit there and say, you know, it's not NCLEX. It's NCLEX on steroids. It really, truly it is. is the, the RN exam amplified and deepened. So we have to be able to teach you to reason. And that's what we do. That's why it's three years and not shorter. But the idea is, what we focus on is not only content, because content is one aspect, but style, but um, uh, format, and discernment. The idea of discerning questions and looking at them critically. Like we teach you, what my goal is always has always been is to teach you to be an item writer. We have you write questions. And if you write questions, you can discern questions. You look at them differently after you've written a few proper, properly formatted uh, items. So that type of preparation, along with everything else that Dr. Ambrose has, has put in to this discussion, puts you in a position where you can reason. You can look at it and say, okay, 
I know the answer, boom. Or I have no idea what the answer is, but let me think through it. Just like you do clinically. When you're in clinical, you're going to think through things for the rest of your career. And that's honestly, that's really what we're preparing you to do is think through situations logically for the rest of your career. Tom, I'm going to ask you quick. Do we have a time limit? Because we're yappers here. <laughs> we, can, we can go. I have as much time as you need. As long as, 30... you as long as you don't mind hearing my kids running around in the background, <laughs> it sounds like it's uh, smack down out there. All right. We'll, we'll press on with questions here then. Uh, are there any courses in the curriculum that can be taken in advance of starting the program? Yes. It just depends on when the program. If you're looking to take them at, at Bloom, it depends on when the course is offered. So they don't, they only offer the courses one time a year, you have to fall within. So if you interview and successfully get in, and I think this dovetails onto another question, everything's due February 1st. When do you interview? We interview in March. No, well, we interview normally in April. Oh, yeah, the end of March. April. April, yeah. We have we have two sessions. We have a virtual session in April, and then we'll have select from there the applicants that want that we want to meet in person and that'll happen mid-may so, so once you find out you get in you could kind of look at what's offered then and you could take something uh foo, uh covid screwed everyone up i see a 3.6 gpa it dropped during covid and it went back up again we look at the whole i don't we don't look at one semester we look at the whole person so have a give me a well-rounded cv and we'll be happy. Where can I take a graduate level course? At a graduate school. No, it's combat. <laughs> um, you can take them at Bloom. You don't have to take them at Bloom. But we do suggest if you get if you gain acceptance to the program and you're looking at graduate course somewhere else that you want to transfer in, please contact Dr. Manzola. Send us a copy of the, the syllabus or ask if the professor if you could send it to us. Send us a course description because it has to meet our standards to be accepted. It has to be across the lifespan and has to cover some things. Because if you take it, we want to make sure you can get it transferred in. So, Just verifying a probability in statistics course is acceptable as a statistics course. You're darn tootin. It says statistics in the name. We're good. Um, let's see. Took a chemistry with a lab. Uh, I don't know what portage learning is for my ABSN program, is that acceptable? You may have to clarify for me. I'm not up to date on that one. Are they are they a an accredited program? And by who are they accredited by? That's usually who you, what you have to determine. Yeah. yeah. When does the application period open? We're open, right? Yeah, we're open. We're open for business. It just ends in February. Um, how long does a student need to live in PA? That's a great question. We run into this with the uh, academic affairs people in the business office. Um, I don't know. Shockingly enough, I think I can answer this one. Um, that is, uh, you have to have lived in Pennsylvania for 12 consecutive months as a non-student. Okay. So you would basically have to move, establish residency, and then start the program. Um, again, you'd have to live for, again, for 12 consecutive months um, but that is a good question. I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to have something to say. Thank you. Uh, oh, here's a fun one. As a significant other of a student, what is the best support we can offer? And is there an involvement community that would help improve our support? This is an excellent wow. question. Yeah. I like it. Number one, cook dinner every night. Number two, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so this is this is difficult for the spouses, loved ones, and other family members the student spends a lot of time away from the family and it, it sort of feels like school comes first for a while. Unfortunately, it sort of does for two years. We still understand all the family things, but there's a lot responsible here. So, you know, in my experience going through the program, when I sat down and talked to my wife about this, um, we talked about, you have to lay down some ground rules. You know, there has to be some set study time. There has to be you know, time that the student can have, that there's a quiet environment, that they could do their thing without the kids, the dogs, the bird, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. The, the best thing you can do as a significant other or a spouse is to be supportive, understand that they're going to be grumpy, moody, tired, they have a lot on their plate. It is a stressful, stressful program. So be as supportive as you can. Um, 
I think Meet. ensure that they have some kind of stress management and going. something that they could have some mental relief. We promote that throughout the program, but I think you have to ensure that as a spouse, like, you know, honey, go take a walk there or go take your half hour or better yet, pick up a hobby with them. So you, uh -huh. so you get the togetherness yeah. time. Both of you do yoga together or both go for a walk on the trail or hit the bike or do whatever you do because you still need that couple bond togetherness time, but yeah. it's hard to get while you're in school. We get it. It's hard to get while they're studying, go for a walk together. Um, do those sort of things. Hey, here's the other question. part of this is that you need to have something that gives back to you because you've diverged in your paths and you need to make sure that you have a way to converge. So if it's the half hour at McDonald's without the kids, it could be something simple, cheap, but you need to have time to make sure that you can remain a support, a supportive partner and a supportive, you know, and, and feel supported. It is, and I always tell people, this is temporary. After about two years, it seems permanent, but it is temporary. That's some sage wisdom. You sound like. Thoreau there, Dr. Gilligan. That is that is good advice. We, we've been there and been there with a lot of different people who yeah. have, and you know, the truth is we've, we've gone through a lot with students and anesthesia programs. You know, there is divorce, there are problems, there are bumps in the road. And our goal is to get people through this hole so that they're intact. So we, we don't want that. We want people to be, we want them and their support system to survive this and be whole. At the end, I feel like we're not making a dent in these questions. They keep coming. Is there a preference <laughs> given between someone with a lot of travel experience and a lot of staff experience? Not necessarily. We like to see, I don't mind seeing travel. We do like to see some staff experience too, because it shows you fit into a unit, but we'll look at both. That's mm -hmm. fine. Will you have the graduate level statistics? We'll have the graduate level statistics completed by mid January. Also enrolled in AP one to boost my GPA. Won't be completed. That's fine. Just tell us about what you're taking. <laughs> Uh, let us know where you're taking it. Send us the, the transcripts when you're done. Took stats in 2017. So we're hitting the five-year mark. Hmm, that, awesome. that should be fine. Okay. How many students do you interview? More than one, less than a million. Um, <laughs> what is the interview process like? It is difficult, but it's fun. That's all I'm going to tell you. It's a, it's a two-part It's a two -part interview. We start online, we screen you, and then we bring you in person. Um, I appreciate the presentation. Wonder some advanced classes that can be transferred. Yes, you could transfer them as long as they meet our requirements. Please send your the transcript of the grades and the syllabus of each course to Dr. Menzola for consideration and we can talk you through. What test scores are you looking for within the application? I don't think we are. No, we don't. We don't, we don't do, do GREs. GREs. No. no, we don't do those. So pass your CCRN and get good grades. Uh, my statistics course five years ago, it depends on how, how far out are you from five years, anonymous attendee. If you're within a couple of months of five years, we'll take it. If it's been if like 30 under, yeah, years. If you're, yeah, if you're under the six year mark, then of course we're gonna take that. It's just, you know, it gets a little too far when it's seven, eight, nine years, then you, you just need a refresher, especially doing a, a terminal degree with a, a doctoral project. Oh, and down the stretch they come. How many applications do you typically receive? More than zero and less than a million. Um, we, we don't. It, the reason I'm well, saying have, this, is I guess, we, I guess one thing to realize is that we have 51 people on this information yeah. session. Right. So you, you can extrapolate from that how many interested people, being that not everybody could be on this session, we have. So it's a very. This is the most difficult part of our life as academicians. We want to give everyone this opportunity, don't we? We want to we want to select people who are likely to be successful academically, clinically, and otherwise. And we want to have people who come in as, co as wonderful colleagues who are going to take care of us someday. Hey, it's, it's, per it's personal. It, yeah. And part of what I'm doing, that's a cop out when I tell you more than zero, less than a million. Uh, we don't release those numbers publicly, like no one knows them outside of the people that are sitting here. But what I will tell you is statistically, if you look nationally, it's harder to get into CRNA school than it is to get into med school. We take a lower percentage of applicants nationally and the, the seat percentage and that kind of stuff. So it's not easy. So it, but please, we encourage you to apply. You, you can't, 
what do they say about the lottery? You can't win unless you try. Drop your application in. What what critical care experience do you like to see? We like to see everything except ER and PACU. It's uh, cardiac, general ICU, SICU, MICU, NICU, PICU, any ICU. We, we like almost all of them. As long as you're doing the, you know, you're working with ventilators, you're titrating drips, you're hands-on with patients doing lines. One of the one of the only other exceptions that we've had is if you were in a virtual ICU, like if you were just monitoring patients, that one's a little different. As long as you're doing hands on yeah. care. I think one of the, the questions we get is people say, well, I had five years critical care experience, but I need a better lifestyle. So I went to an outpatient surgery for the past two years or year and a half. You have to stay current. So we would suggest go back to the critical care unit because things change with the hands-on, with the equipment, with policies, protocols, uh, just a ton of things change. You have to be current in your critical care practice. We highly encourage that for application. To clarify, do students have to live in Pennsylvania for 12 months before the program? No, but if you wanna be considered an in-state in student and pay in-state tuition, yes but you don't, you can move during the program. Yes, and, and I'm sorry, just, just, just to clarify. So if you were already a Pennsylvania resident, okay, that doesn't necessarily apply. It's only if you're coming from another state yeah. and would like to pay Pennsylvania tuition for reasons that I completely understand, mm -hmm. um, you would have to establish residency by living in Pennsylvania for 12 consecutive months. Yep, while not being a student if that makes sense. But that is a good question, Andrew. I appreciate you asking for clarification. When do applications open? They're open now. Um, that that apply now link is always on the website. So when you apply, that goes to the admissions office and that starts getting collated. And I'm um, sorry, can you clarify, Dr. Ambrose? So right now you are taking applications, not necessarily for 2023, it's for 2024, right? Uh, that's the next question and that's perfect. I think okay. that's the next, let me see. What year are we? Oh, wait. No, we, we have 23. Now. So our class of 23 is our seniors. Our class so, of 24. So they're are, saying when they're coming in though. That's what they're they're asking. I when have to work. I in. have to do my backwards math. So 23 is our seniors. 24 is our juniors. 25 is on Bloom's campus right now. Yeah. So it would be for the graduating class of 26. So you would start. 20, it's 24. Yeah, he, or, oh, it's the class of 27 is the cohort yeah. we're doing for. So you'd start so, in 2024. So essentially you, what you do is you apply a full year in advance. Like, so yeah. from honestly, for all of our other grad programs that we have to come with you in Bloomsburg, right now we have students who are applying for this fall, for fall of 2023. For this, uh, the DNP nurse anesthesia program, you apply a full year in advance. So the next cohort that we are accepting applications for would start in the fall of 2024. And whoever asked that question, I hope that answers it. And if you need clarification, please let, please let us know. I think know. it's summer 2024. Yeah. I'm sorry, summer 2020. Summer. Yes, summer. And is there an email to submit items like BLS, ACLS, PAL, CCRN? No, that is in the application. So not directly on the application form you fill out, but there is a place within the online application on that Apply Now website where you could send those scan documents in. CCRN, um, send us a scan of, hey, I passed, or send us a scan of your card, and that'll prove you've passed your CCRN. Tom, so I think it's like somebody had their hand raised. Or uh, the they did. Uh, I see the hand is now down. And I'm sorry, just real, real quick with the app. So what happens is you, you submit the online application, and then that um, by submitting the app, it gives you access to this online portal. Um, and the online portal is where you have all these different locations where you're able to um, you know, upload some of these additional documents. And if anyone has any questions, again, my email's in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Another one, from your experience, have you seen applicants that had a previous science degree prior to nursing school needing to retake all of their prereqs because of age? I graduated in 2016 with chemistry, physics, and anatomy all in that degree, graduated with an ABSN in 2019. I've seen people with that kind of background being some of our strongest candidates, but I would like to hear Dr. Minzola's opinion on this, because if you've done a hard science degree and then did an ABSN, right. you're, you're, you're a scientist 
who right you have those prerequisites already yeah, that's right. right you know so you you your acumen i think that's what we tried to you know when you where the rubber meets the road is do you understand science do you understand chemistry physics biology anatomy if you can understand that and, and you've done a degree in it that's a pretty substantial thing especially doing it all at once as opposed to nursing where you're spread out throughout throughout a bunch of things and i'm sorry and i see um, megan has a question megan um you're more than welcome to to ask your question i saw your hand was raised sorry for for missing that Hey there, Megan. It should be. Um, a I there. just I didn't. You there, Megan? Okay. Well, while you're while you're figuring it out, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and put your hand down. Oh, Sorry, so Megan, if you're having any kind of. It looks like that was an accident. Oh, um, okay. Gotcha. Well, we'll wave at you anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. We would we find out in the summer months if we are accepted if the interviews are in April and May. Um, At the end of May, you know, you yeah. know, in May, yeah. we try to do it within uh, probably a week after we have our last group of in-person uh, interviews in May. So virtual are in April. We have a couple of days of that. And then uh, our in person are in May, and then we don't want to have you waiting forever. And we understand everyone's anxious about it, excited. Some people are applying to different programs, and like Dr. Gilligan said, you know, we promote that. We say, go ahead, look around, see if you feel like you fit somewhere else better. Even though we have the best program. <laughs> well, you know, while but, attending first year, is there an opportunity to teach Sim Lab to undergrad? There is tuition assistance. You mm -hmm. can do that as a first year up on the campus. You could be a sim lab assistant. Graduate assistant, yep. Cost of living around Bloomsburg. Well, is there campus housing for people coming out of state? There are a lot of places around Bloomsburg and around Danville um, because we have a, a lot of residencies at the hospital. So there's a lot of resident housing that turns over and there's a lot of, there's PA students, nursing students, all that kind of stuff. Um, cost of living. Uh, I came from Allentown, so it's cheaper than Allentown, but it, you know, inflation's kind of a thing. It, it's it's hard for me to really quantify cost of living. So I, I would say the cost of living is um, a lot of that is, is kind of dependent upon what your frame or frame of reference is. Um, I would say it's going to be fairly inexpensive compared to uh, the location of probably where most other uh, DNP programs would be located. I would imagine a lot of these are probably going to be in cities where the cost of living is going to be significantly higher than what it would be in Bloomsburg and Danville. Someone who lives in Danville, I can also say there are an abundance of housing opportunities within close proximity of the hospital. Uh, I won't throw fellow programs under the bus, but we're cheaper than Philly, Pittsburgh, and Scranton. So if that gives you an idea. Uh, <laughs> and actually the next slide that we want to get to is, is the cost. So um, as soon as we get to the questions, we can. Do you have a wait list? Um, we do take what we do take people into consideration for uh, alternate. alternates, mm -hmm. but we don't have like a year ahead wait list. Uh, do you want us to submit our CCRN certificate with or without score? Um, you know what? If you want to submit it with the score, submit it with the score. We just like to see that you've passed the test and you have the certification. Holy cow, they're still coming. Uh, That's good. That's good. Do Bloom students compare for OR hours or cases? With, oh, compete. I misread that. Yes and no. So we do have a residency at Geisinger Danville. Um, they practice at Geisinger Danville and they practice at OSW, one of our surgery centers that's near the hospital. That's it. Our students practice in, what is it, eight other hospitals that are all in the Geisinger network. And we do not compete with residents at any of those hospitals. So at Danville, I wouldn't call it competition. You kind of work alongside them. You don't work with them in the same room, but you work alongside them. But we have no problems in getting our case numbers. And I also, I, I mean, as an example, we're all practicing clinicians. I think that's something important to bring out is that Dr. Minzola, Ambrose, and I, are we still give anesthesia. I work at Geising and Wyman Valley where we don't have residents at all. We have other schools, but we have good collaboration with our schools and your learning is a priority. I think that's important to recognize. 
Uh, ooh, next question is uh, a rotation question with residents again. It, we just talked about that one. Can the application fee be waived for attending this event? You could you no. could send you could send your check courtesy of Dr. Theodore and no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, we, we, we um, still... can you answer that? <laughs> yes. Uh, we can, because uh, the application is through, uh, I just have to make sure it's not through, so there's this organization called CAS, that we, there are some applications through that, um, but this is not the case. So, um, yes, do me a favor, email me. So, because what I need is documentation, um, and because this is in Zoom, um, this is not in our traditional software that facilitates our application, I just need documentation for anyone, if you email me. We, uh, I can I can get the application fee waived. Uh, my, my boss calls that a uh, thirty five dollar uh, scholarship, which is a, a difficult line to deliver with a street face. I love it. That's that. That's nice. You know what, that's something I will tell you. Having been other places is not done everywhere. Hmm. It's a very good thing. Yeah, yes. well, and that's a great question. I, I appreciate you asking. Are there set hours during the week for access to the sim lab? When you come to us on Geisinger's campus, our sim lab is open to you 24 seven. We just ask you don't destroy it. You have um, password access to our, our school, our, our little area that's a school and that includes the sim lab. So you'll, you, you'll have access to our learning lab. Now the nice simulation center they're building on Bloomsburg's campus, it's not quite built yet. I would imagine that's going to have hours and that's going to have people that let you in and out of the doors. But our, our sim center on Danville's campus, you can use. If you need to retake statistics as a refresher, should it be a graduate level course? Hmm. Good question. Not necessarily, but you can. I mean, truly of the math. Of course, that looks great. Yes. If you could take a graduate level statistics course. And do um, well. If you could yeah. find one, yeah, and do well. If you can't find one, then you know, I would just suggest that you take a statistics course, whatever you could find, but we would appreciate any graduate level course you can take. Ooh, Dr. Gilligan, this one's for you. Hey, we have a, a shout out for Dr. Gilligan. Yes, this is from uh, Stephen. I just accepted a critical care position at Wyoming Valley. Is there any chance I could shadow with you? Absolutely. I would love to have somebody shadow with me. Nice. Look like at that, we, we're making connections. We love the idea of somebody coming in and, you know, honestly, this is about giving you exposure. I've had a rare person who comes into the operating room and looks around and goes, no. But 99% of people love the idea of operative care. And as an anesthesia provider, that operative care is very special. So I would, um, you can reach out to me. We can put our contact information up. You can reach out to me and we can figure this out, but I would love to have you shadow me. I work, I work a later shift, so we may have to, you know, work on schedules, but yes. Dr. Gilgan, the easiest if, you're, if, if you're an employee, that makes it a lot easier. The easiest thing, what you could you just put your email in the chat? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. I worked in a specialty float for our CTICU and step down unit that floated to all units in the hospital, including med surge. Is that a positive or negative to my application? Question. All of the above? I find it positive. You know, yeah. a lot of experience, as long as you're still in uh, working in the ICU area, that's great. I mean, we like to see as much ICU time as we can. But the other end of that is you're a well-rounded nurse because you're seeing all the different facets of nursing care and dealing with patients at all their steps along the way. So it's good. Oh, we got all the questions. 58 of them. Holy cow. I think, yeah, honestly, all outstanding questions, too. They're all, I, I appreciate everyone asking, and, and this group has hung with us. I think I laughably started by saying, yeah, this should take 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, I would say thank you to each person who invested yeah. the time in asking a question. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, and I know one of the questions we get pretty frequently on our end is the cost. And the, the reality is um, college and grad program, doctoral programs are not free, right? Um, so there is a cost associated with it. And the good news is for anyone going into this field, A, you know you're going to graduate, B, you know you're going to get a job, and C, you know your earning potential is going to be pretty high. Um, but we do try to be transparent with the cost. Um, 
And when you see the differences, it, it's it's even a somewhat negligible difference between in-state and out-of-state, um, but that's not to say that it's not a difference. So this is the in-state cost. This is the out-of-state cost. And again, um, per semester, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it would be nine credits is the traditional course load. Um, some of our course load, since we went to the uh, doctor of nursing practice is, I think the highest is 13 or 14 credits one semester. There's a couple okay. semesters that are higher in credit load. Okay. But a majority of the semesters, it's nine credits? Yes. Okay. Now I will say, even with that, we are one of the most cost effective programs yes. out there. We, you know, if you compare us nationally, even in state, we are one of the, uh, most affordable tuitions you'll find for a doctoral anesthesia program. Yep, absolutely. And, and again, trying to mitigate the debt you take on, it, it, it um, you know you're gonna have, a, again, you, you know you're gonna be a high earner. Um, however, it is nice to have less to pay back, right? So you can, you know, fast forward to getting to the amenities that a career like this would be able to provide. Yeah. Um, and I will say, I, I wanted to give a shout out too. This is a great way to follow along with the program is following them on Instagram um, at Bloomsburg NAP. And it's a nice way. Again, we talked a lot about like, what's the life of a student like? This is the best way, honestly, to figure it out is it's kind of a, um, a window into the program. And uh, Dr. Menzola and her team of social media specialists do a great job of, of managing this account. So I would encourage everyone to follow along. Uh, no Facebook, no MySpace. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call even remembers MySpace, but uh, no, we're, we're, we're on Instagram. Um, and that is the contact information for Dr. Menzola and Dr. Ambrose. And I know Dr. Gilligan um, just recently put his, uh, his email in the chat. So uh, let me see. I see we have a couple more questions here. Oh, and they're great ones there. Thank you. You are oh, very welcome. You. Yes, yes. No, again, really appreciate, honestly, I, um, you guys have all been listening intently for a long time. Um, I think, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jacob. So uh -huh. and we really, you guys, honestly, almost every single person has stayed with us for the last 90 minutes. And I know there's probably a Netflix show or something, you know, um, <laughs> that you're anxiously waiting to get through or dinner or time with family. So really, truly appreciate that. Honestly, I mean that. And we look forward to seeing your applications. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And please, if, if, um, if this um, event just peaked questions or peaked interest, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I would love to tell you that I'd be able to answer a lot of the questions, but I think you all know by now that Dr. Ambrose, Dr. Menzola, and Dr. Gilligan are probably going to be your primary points of contact, but I'm happy to help facilitate that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate all the thank yous. Also remember too, if you have uh, colleagues or people who you want to share this with, please share it. And yep. we we're, we are more than glad to do this again. Mm -hmm. but the, the idea is that you know spread the word. We have we have a great program. We want you to find out everything you need to know about it to make a decision, and also, you know, bring your best, most competent, most accomplished friends, and continue this process of making. Yep. You know, us bringing about great anesthesia providers and great colleagues. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for putting this together for us, Tom. This was great. Oh, Our first yeah, ever, thanks, our inaugural. Tom. Yeah, the webinar. inaugural. No, no, no. The pleasure was all mine. No, thanks required. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I think that's all we have for tonight. Um, I don't see any additional uh, questions. Yeah, I can't really hear my kids now. Uh, uh, happy holidays. Yeah, you're doing fine. <laughs> um, again, thank you, everybody. And uh, we look forward to hearing from everybody in the future. Oh, and again, I will send out the recording as soon as this is done as well to everybody. I will post it online for anyone who couldn't be with us. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.